All right. As Elizabeth said, I have been the genealogy librarian at LAPL for seven years. But just to give you an idea, um, the genealogy librarian before me, who's sort of a legend in the field, was here for 35 years. So there's not much turnover. Um, it's a great job. And, uh, and so I'm not sure if I'll last 35 years. We'll see. I love Los Angeles, love it so much, but I am originally from Iowa. And um, I have made a visit to the beautiful Allen County Public Library's Genealogy Center before. So three cheers for the Midwest. You'll see my contact information here on this slide above the lovely photo of Central Library. Um, but just know that information and a lot of the stuff that I'm gonna talk about today is in the handout Elizabeth pointed you to. So you don't have to take copious notes. And plus this is gonna be recorded so you could watch it again later if you'd like. Um, our library has been in existence uh, in different buildings and different locations in downtown LA for 149 years. We started in 1872 in a huge block sized building known as the Downey Block which is about a mile and a half from our current downtown location. The library was on the second floor in this building you see in the illustration. We moved to City Hall in 1889 and then had two more moves into bigger buildings until we moved to our current location in a building that was built in 1926. Now, many of you may know we had a big fire here in 19. 1986. It was before my time, but it's sort of a legendary disaster. Um, it destroyed about 20% of our holdings. And today, even, you'll pull a book from the shelf, usually in closed stacks or periodicals, and you'll see the damage that the fire did. The book survived, but it's been singed. Um, it was deemed arson, and the arsonist was never caught. And um, if you want to learn more about that in a fascinating read, check out this book, the library book by Susan Orlean. She talks all about the fire. So rebuilt, repaired, and reopened in 1993, our library rebounded. Today, we have Central Library, which is in this picture here, plus 72 branches, housing more than 6 million volumes and serving over 18 million residents. It's the largest population of any publicly funded library system in the United States. Now, that being said, I like to think that we still manage to help people at an individual, almost small town level. I mean, each of our branches has its own personality, its own community, and each floor in Central Library focuses on different subjects. History and genealogy can be found on the very bottom floor, and that is the lore it says that that's because our books are the heaviest, but I think the art department might have a good argument um, for having heavier books, but, but that's, that's what the word on the street while we're down there. Um, genealogy has been a popular area of research at our library since its very, very beginnings. Here's the genealogy room in the 1930s. Uh, the handout will give you a general overview of the kinds of resources we have um, at the library. And we do have approximately 52,000 genealogy related book titles. And you'll also find, of course, databases that we subscribe to so our patrons can have access to some sometimes expensive genealogy databases. We have indexes, both in print form and in database online form. And I'm gonna talk about those a little bit today. City directories, family histories, heraldry and coats of arms books. I hear that our collection is one of the biggest west of the Mississippi. And many how-to books that you can check out. Uh, most of our genealogy material is reference only, meaning you have to use it here at Central Library. But we do have some how-to books that you can check out. We also have so many other resources that you can use for genealogy, immigration records, local histories, maps, military records, name books, 
newspapers, periodicals, telephone books, vital records, and more. Now this presentation is going to primarily focus on ways you can use the resources of our library from afar. Since I know most of you are watching today from afar, I saw a couple California people check in, but um, I think the lion's share are not here uh, very close to us. So I will focus on things that you can use um, from your homes, but I first wanna give you an, a, a sense of what our department looks like, just in case you do visit. So here is a map of the history and genealogy department. You can see the shaded areas here represent genealogical materials. Uh, we've got phone books, city directories, microfilm and microfiche sets, indexes, and a few periodicals in this reading room. For as much as we have that is out in this browsing area, we have many more items in closed stacks. And they're, st they're stored back there purely for space reasons. Um, not because they're super valuable and we want to make sure they don't get stolen, although there are some of those um, around, of course. It's just that we've run out of room in the reading room, and so we have a lot in closed stacks. But anything you find in the catalog that we have, we will retrieve for you. We're a public library, and our material is open to all of the public. And here is where I sit. If you come visit, you'll see me sitting at the reference desk or some of my colleagues in the history department. In our public space, we have a nice set of modern microfilm readers and they let you email your findings to yourself for free. So that's kind of nice and they're really nice quality too. We also have plenty of desk space. Um, oftentimes local genealogical societies will come in for a tour and then afterwards they'll uh, grab a bunch of books, station themselves at these desks and get to work. Now this is to show you what our closed stacks look like. Uh, it's not open to the public, but I thought I'd show you a picture just to give you an idea of those old fashioned sort of um, compression shelves. You'll notice my compression shelves, which are on the right, are manual and the history department on the left, it's the electric ones. Now, I don't know what that's all about, but um, theirs do break down a little more often than mine do. So I'm not gonna complain too much, <laughs> just kidding. Um, some of the items that we store back here uh, are our family histories. All of our family histories are back there. Uh, we have approximately 14,000 family histories. 14,000, and they're mostly obtained by, by donation. Um, so sometimes they're pretty much one of a kind, self-published sorts of things. I'll show you how to look for those in our catalog. Also, our heraldry collection is in closed stacks. We have these beautiful Netherlands. They're over. They're huge. I can hardly lift one myself. Um, but uh, we have all of our heraldry back there. Also, um, our California records are back there. Most of well, all of the states of the U.S., um, all countries except for Great Britain, um, are in the reading room for people to look through except well, all the states of the US except for California. And that's because um, we have a lot and they're oftentimes very fragile. We also keep our oversized or folio books um, in closed stacks. And these are some of those gorgeous historical atlases for the counties of the US you've run into. Now we absolutely want you to stop in the next time you visit LA, but there are many resources of ours that you can use from home right now without even becoming a library member. The first resource I'd like to collect is probably my favorite, the Genealogy and Local History Index, which is basically a surname index that I like to describe as a mini Percy, if I may be so bold. <laughs> the index started out in card format. We have rows and rows of drawers of these cards organized by surname and then sometimes organized by location within the surname. Whenever a new book or magazine comes in, we check to see if it mentions families that might not be evident by the book description or the catalog record. For instance, a book about the Jones family might include loads of Smiths who married Joneses in it, but the book information and the catalog record don't reflect that. So how do you find your Smiths? 
Well, this index strives to help you with that issue. So you can see here that this index card references the Fogg family. This card tells us the book entitled Descendants of Edward Small has material about the Fogg family on page 909. And the call number for that book is given on the card. So you would find the book and turn to page 909 for your people. But as of about 1996 or so, we stopped creating new index cards and instead started putting the index information into a database that anyone can access via our website. We have also been retroactively putting the data from these existing cards into this database, but it's been quite time consuming. Um, the database currently contains all the information from the cards through the letter F. This was a project we worked on while we were working from home this last COVID year. Each of us took a drawer home. There are about 11 of us. We each took a drawer home and got busy inputting those cards into this database from home. Before we did that, we were only up through the letter, through the letter C. So that kind of gives you an idea how, how much work it is. We went from the letter C to the letter F in about a year, and that was 11 people doing it. So, um, so it's an endeavor, but quite worth it. Ideally, you would want to look for your relations in both this physical card format and the online index, uh, since the transfer, as I said, of the physical cards to the database is not yet complete. But since you might not be able to come into our library soon, you can at least start with the online index. And this is in your handout, but here's how you can access our online genealogy and local history index. You go to our website, www.lapl.org, hover over this education and research um, area, and you'll see a drop down apron come up with some choices in it. You want to choose databases. Now, this is how you're always going to want to get to the databases page for most of the resources I talk about today. You'll see a big, long alphabetical list of all the databases we offer patrons. And um, what you want to do is scroll down for this resource to the genealogy and local history index and click on it. Once you're to this page with the blanks, you'll see some searching tips above it. Um, so, but how I usually start, especially if I have sort of an unusual surname, is I just type the surname in the family personal corporate name blank. Once you hit enter, you'll see the index records come up for that surname. And if you can kind of see in, in these three choices here, there are 32 total results for Chenoweth so far in our online index. This first one is a good example of what I was talking about before. The catalog record and the book description for this book referenced, Colonial Families of Maryland, mentions nothing about most of the family names that appear in it. But the indexer noticed that a significant number of Chenoweths as long as all these other family names mentioned were included in the book. So he or she put them in this index record along again with all the other surnames you see. Our rule is that a surname has to show up for three different people on three different pages. So not every surname in every book is included in this index, but we've tried to include many. There are a variety of ways you can search this database. Just do what we just did before, a surname search in the family blank. Or you could add a location if you want to fine tune it. If, many, if so many Chenoweths came up, you want to limit it to Maryland Chenoweths because you know that's where they're from. Or you can also add an allied family name in the keyword blank. And this way, the references you find might really be about your family because it will be about two surnames that are in your tree. But remember, the more search terms you use, the less index records will pop up. So I usually start with few terms and then amp it up if I have a Jones or a Smith. So what happens if you find an index record that looks to be good for your family, that looks like your family, but you can't make it into our library to check the actual resource? 
Well, many of our books were indexed ages ago, meaning the books the index references may now be in the public do domain. In other words, no longer copyright protected. And if the book the index is pointing to has a copyright before 1926, as of this year, 2021, then that, that is the case usually. You'll want to check digitized book websites to see if a full copy, full text copy of it is on the internet. And my, and I have a list of my favorite um, digitized book websites in the handout. And there are some that might surprise you, so definitely take a look at that. This book does happen to be uh, digitized online. I found it at archive.org. And you'll see the publishing dates 1925, and here it is on archive.org fully. If you find a book um, in our index and you, you want to access it, but, uh, but you can't come in, another thing you can do is look at WorldCat. It's an online, WorldCat is an online catalog that helps you find which libraries a book resides in. And this book, as well as being in our library, also is in these Indiana libraries. So you could visit someone nearby you, perhaps. This, this index serves as a pointer to this book, but that doesn't necessarily mean you have to be in LA to read it. If you can't find the book or magazine referenced anywhere, Unfortunately, you won't be able to request us to send it to you. We don't send our books out for interlibrary loan. But email me, and I'll give you a list of local researchers who could come in to scan the item for you, but they do charge fees to do that. Another resource you can access from home is our digitized collection of LA city and street directories. City directories are those directories organized by person's surname, like a phone book. Street directories are those organized by address, and they tell you who lived at that address. So far, we've put up 158 city and street directories. Los Angeles proper city directories span from 1873 through 1942, but some of our neighborhoods continued after that. And our street directories collection runs a little later in years uh, than, than the city directories. People research, why you might want to use the street directories a lot. We have a, one of our popular questions when people come to the reference desk is they're investigating the history of their house, um, which might sound a little strange or might not. I thought, I, I guess I really hadn't thought about it until people started asking me to research the history of their house. But street directories are great for that, especially the printed ones, because they're organized by address. So you look up your address, and depending on the year, it will tell you who lived at that address. So you can figure out who lived in your house. Now, because we've digitized these street directories, and they're searchable by keywords, they almost serve as a city directory in a way, because you can search by a person's name, and it will pop up in the street directory. Whereas if you're looking at a print street directory, you have to look at the address to find the people. So it gives us a little more power with these uh, volumes. So we'll, we'll continue digitizing them, that's for sure. We have some unusual directories you won't find anywhere else, okay? And so this is kind of a recent development, but this at the top, the second from the left, this 1874 California, Oregon and Nevada trades guide, which I guess is sort of a precursor to the yellow pages, is not yet even in WorldCat. So we're working on getting that done, but I found it in our rare books department and we were able to get that scan. And so that's up for people to view for free from our, on our website. And in the middle row on the far right, first Los Angeles telephone directory. Now it's only three pages long and has about 30 entries in it because I guess telephones were really not um, around in 1882. Um, only a select few had them. But uh, a colleague of mine in the rare books department says she saw at an antiquarian book site one of these in print. Um, and it was, I think it was selling for $15,000, which I think is probably overpriced, but still, I mean, it was quite, quite expensive. And then also, which I didn't really realize, even though I've done a load of 
city directory research. Um, more than one publisher could publish a city directory for a year. You'll see on the bottom here, the left three um, are Los Angeles city directories for the year 1883 to 1884. So you want to check every one of them because they might have slightly different information. Now, some of our directories granted are replicated in the Ancestry.com collection of digitized city directories. But these are our own scans. Uh, we use an optical character recognition um, software program called ResCarta. I'm, I'm not an expert on that stuff, but I'm not sure if that's the same one Ancestry uses, but I've noticed a little bit of differences sometimes when I'm searching using keywords in Ancestry than when I do it in our, our database. So if you have any trouble finding your people in Ancestry, try out our version of the same city directory. And also, we do have some city directories that Ancestry does not have. Another resource you can use is our city directories index. Now, these are not digitized directories. It's simply an index that tells you what directories we have here at the library. Directories that we have in either print, microfilm, or microfiche format, and it'll tell you if we did digitize it as well. So um, basically, you type in the name of a city right here, and you can do any city from across the nation. We have a bunch of city directories here. And when you hit find it, you'll see what we have for that city in microfilm format, paper format, any other format we might have, and also if it's been digitized. In our collection, I mean. And our print collection consists of directories that are not in that huge microfilm set, City Directories of the United States, that Ancestry.com digitized. We have that microfilm set, by the way. Um, and that's the one that Ancestry.com digitized. But the ones, the city directories that we keep in the in the browsing and the reading room are ones that are not in that set. So sometimes you find some unique holdings here. We also have many phone books. Now, mostly from Southern California, but some from other states. We've got a pretty healthy New York collection. And even some international phone books. We have many phone books from each Mexican state in the 1990s. We don't yet have an online, an online index for these though. Um, so you can always email me or call us to, let, to ask us if we happen to have a certain phone book, but you won't be able to find that using an index like you could for the city and street directories. If you're researching California people or subjects, you're gonna want to check out our California index. This is an index that our California subject specialist, Kelly Wallace, maintains. Um, we have three subject specialists here in the history and genealogy department. I'm the genealogy person. Kelly does California, and we have Glenn Creason, who is our map librarian. So we focus on different um, subjects within our focus subject of history and genealogy, but California index is one that Kelly maintains. And just like any other of the databases I mentioned earlier, you type in your keywords, hit find it, and then you'll see what comes up in our California index. Now the California index is a little different than the genealogy and local history index in that in some cases, like in this case, it actually provides a link for you to click and then see the actual, um, reference that this index is pointing you to. So that means you don't have to come down here and ask for this Wilmington Press Journal on microfilm and find this article. You just click on that link and you can see it. Now on our website, we have an entire area that's devoted to digitized material. It's called TESA. And that is after one of our first librarians here at the library, Tessa Kelso. She was sort of a legendary figure in our library's history. And so we have honored her by using her name as our digital resources uh, name. 
to check out all of the digitized stuff we have in one spot, you can again click on education and research and that little apron will pop down. This time though, click on TESSA. You'll scroll down the page to see the different collections. Here you can see, um, and these are just a few, our photo collection. Also an archive that patrons contributed to during the COVID year. That was such a neat um, project that Kelly Wallace and uh, Suzanne M. Uh, piloted. We put a shout out to our, our community to sh give us poems, uh, photographs, drawings, stories, anything to, to, to show us how they were coping with the COVID year when we were all sequestered indoors usually. Um, and it's gonna be really invaluable for future historians when they're looking back in time to see how we lived during this very odd moment in history. Uh, so that, that is an archive you might wanna take a look at if you're curious. We also have a collection of fruit crate labels. Oranges were quite a crop here in California and the propaganda to advertise them resulted in some very beautiful fruit crate labels. So we have a, list, a, a digitized set of those. And we also have a lot of early California, early Los Angeles maps that Glenn has had digitized and put on our website. For this one, I'm gonna feature the photo collection for a moment. So shortly before World War II, our library began collecting photographs and they amassed about 13,000 images by the late 50s. Well, then the word was out and we started receiving many donations of collections from, from repositories, from businesses, and now we have quite a large amount of photos. We have been digitizing them and making them accessible via our website and now have well over 126,000 images available to view. You can order copies. In fact, a lot of the downtown restaurants will find a, a photo of their restaurant in like the early 20s and they'll order a huge wall size print so that they can display it in their restaurant. That's, that's something that happens a decent amount of time, but you can order copies that are printed nicely. There could be some usage restri um, restrictions, but all the information about that sort of thing you'll find here on this, this website, web page. To search the image, you're gonna type in your keywords, click search, and then see what comes up. If you're perusing our list of databases, the observant genealogy fan will notice this one, the obituary index. However, temper your excitement somewhat. This obituary index is not for quote, ordinary people obituaries, like the ones found in most of our families. This one is for famous people. And wait for it, librarians. So I will give you three guesses as to who put this index together. <laughs> but I wanted to mention it because I'm sure you were gonna run into it if you were looking down our list of databases. Um, but anyway, it is helpful, but usually only when you're looking for someone famous or a librarian. One surprising resource the COVID year enabled was when we switched from in-person genealogy events to recorded online events. And, you know, I have a pretty steady community of genealogy garage people who would come here in person. Shout out to you if you're watching today. I appreciate you. Um, and so we didn't have, when we closed down last March, we didn't have any input course. And so finally around September, I don't know why it took me so long, I, I emailed all, a lot of the people who come in all the time and I asked, would you like some online programming? And I got such an overwhelming response of yes. So happily with technology, we have been able to do that. And, um, we're able to record and post most of them after the fact, just like Elizabeth was showing you her YouTube, your, the Allen County YouTube channel. That's how you would find ours too. Uh, the best way right now to 
find them would be to go directly to YouTube and type Genealogy Garage Los Angeles Public Library as your keywords. We don't yet have a link to the whole set on our website. We will soon, um, but for now, that's what you need to do. But we've got quite a bit of interesting subjects that people have graciously agreed to um, give presentations on. So check that out. We subscribe to several databases that are of interest to genealogy researchers, but these are only available either on site or with one of our library cards. I just want to mention them though for your information. So we'll just go through them quickly. And by the way, well, let me go through them first here and then I'll say my bit. Um, Access Newspaper Archive, AmericanAncestors.org, Ancestry Library Edition, Find My Past, which is where you'll find Percy, Heritage Quest Online, History Geo, which is a first landowner's database, and also um, antiquarian maps, Jewish data, which has a dynamite collection of transcribed headstones from around the world, and many digitized newspapers, mostly Southern California, um, but, but they're a great resource for, for searching for those obituaries. Um, now, to get one of our library cards, you just have to be a California resident. So that's good news for all of you who are tuning in today who aren't in Los Angeles, but you happen to be in California. The kicker is you have to come in in person to apply for it. So um, just make sure if you're driving through, pull off into one of our um, branches with your ID and get a library card. Because just anybody in California can get one for free. Uh, we do have e-cards uh, that one can use as an option to access our databases and e-media, but e-cards are only available for people living in Los Angeles city limits. So um, uh, that, that does kind of limit the pool. Now, speaking of e-media, I have been really boosting our ebook holdings lately using Overdrive. We figure if people are staying at home, they're going to have to research from home. And I really, really amped up the purchasing. We have now over 600 titles. Um, again, to uh, download these, you need a library card to do that. But one of the things, I pretty much ordered every genealogy title from Overdrive, which is a really popular e-media um, provider. So if you saw something in our e-media catalog that looks interesting to you, you could possibly just tell your library if they have an Overdrive um, subscription to acquire that title. And I'm sure they'd love to hear that input anyway. I'm not sure if I mentioned this, but we actually do have books here at the library. I know everything I'm talking about is digital and database and this and that, but we have bona fide paper books. Um, I think the best way you will right here, if you want to just do a quick search, just go on our main page, type in your keywords and you can find what you want. But if you're going to look for family histories, for instance, specifically, what I like to do is change this drop down menu from keyword to subject. And then in the search box, I put the surname I'm looking for plus the word family. And this is going to focus for Chenna with family in the subject line of all the books. So you're just going to get really bona fide family histories, very pointedly. Just family histories. To find out what county records we have, and we have county records from all the states, pretty much all the states in America, I stick with the keyword um, kind of search, but I'm pretty specific in my searching terms. So usually put the name of the county, the word county, and then the name of the state in there. And then what you'll see. Um, you'll see everything we have for that location that you're researching, not just county histories. These are two county histories, but we'll, you'll also find if we have any vital collection uh, compilations that maybe a local genealogy group put together, or maybe some head, headstone transcriptions from a cemetery in a small town, uh, military rosters, et cetera. 
We also subscribe to many, many genealogy periodicals. We get newsletters, general interest magazines, genealogy journals, and family association serials. So if you find a reference to an article in a specific periodical using Percy by using Find My Past or using our index, you can check our catalog to see if we have that periodical so you can see the actual article. So in this example, we're interested in, in seeing in finding the, the journal California Historian. And we specifically want the uh, issue that's summer 2008. So you check our online catalog to see if we have California Historian, and sure enough, we do. And if you can um, decipher this cryptic holding statement, which I, sometimes I, I really do, I have to pause and I'm like, okay, what's that say? Um, if you can decipher it, you can tell if we've got the issue you need. Now, this um, holding statement means we have June. Our first issue was June 1986. And since there's no end date after the um, hyphen, that means we're still subscribing to it today. So since we're looking for summer 2008, that means we would have the issue you need um, to, to look at that article. Now, we do have a fee-based article request service. So one could, in theory, request that we scan this article and email it to them. But currently, that service is only available for library card holders. This could change in the future. Uh, so email me if you do find something interesting in a periodical we own, and I'll give you the, the current status. We have some indexes one can only access in person at our library, and while I know it might be a while until you can come visit us, I want to bring them to your attention. The first is a coat of arms index. It, like our original genealogy and local history index, exists in card catalog format in our reading room. But unlike the Genealogy and Local History Index, we haven't yet created an online version of it. It will point you to books or journals that feature an image of a coat of arms or a blazon, which is a, which is a verbal description of a coat of arms for a specific surname. So this example points us to a book about the coats of arms and flags, Fahnen, of Switzerland, Der Schweiz. On page 121, we should find a color example for the Mellingen family. And this is the image I retrieved from the book. I think there is a lot of potential for us to digitize this index. And, and here's also why I think that. Um, most of the heraldry books we have are very old and most likely in the public domain. So we could do something like what the California index does in which we link, we include a link in the index record, which would bring up the material it's referencing. So you wouldn't have to find this book that had the Mellingen coat of arms. You would just click on a PDF and up it would pop. I think that would be dynamite. And so that'll be a project down the road. The next group of indexes is probably, sadly, our least used but it is a very valuable collection item, our printed magazine indexes. These are published indexes for specific journals or specific groups of journals. In fact, we have many Percy annuals in physical format before we subscribed to Find My Past or before I believe it was Heritage Quest that had Percy. Um, we got them in print form and they're on the shelves. So if an indexes aren't finding your people in journals, look to these to see if anything fell through the cracks. Of course, for that though, you do need to be here in person. Finally, I wanna talk about our family history special collection. You know, when you find a box in the garage of old photos or old marriage certificates or military papers, or you find folders of family history material in the attic that a great aunt put together, and then you think, 
That is, if you're not one of us, of course, what the heck am I going to do with this? I can't throw it out, but I'm running out of room in this house. Well, people donate that stuff to us. And I usually take it within reason because we have limited space too, but we include it in a special collection we have called the pamphlet and manuscript collection, which is basically large manila folders of ephemera stored in file cabinets in closed stacks. In this example, let's say someone brought this in as a donation. We've got a relationship chart, a marriage certificate, letters, a photograph. And so what I do is I look at the material and figure out what the most prominent surname is. And we create, in this instance, a Jones family folder. Now, how do you find out if we have a pamphlet and manuscript folder that might relate to your family? Well, two ways, computer or in person. Online, you want to check that genealogy and local history index I've been talking about. And this record is going to lead you to, to ask us to retrieve this folder. Now you can see the index record is very spare in describing what's actually in this Brown family pamphlet and manuscript folder. I'm working to correct that. But right now you just have to ask for the folder in person and it, the contents could either be a fabulous birthday present or a white elephant gift, not related to you at all. The other way is if you're in here in person is to check that card card catalog version of the genealogy and local history index. And when you see one of these yellow cards with pamphlet and manuscript collection written on it, that's your clue that there's one. And so again, you would ask us to retrieve it for you. Someday we may get around to digitizing the contents of the special collection, but we're a little nervous at the moment about running into some privacy or copyright issues. Um, so we'll have to sort through that. And then it might just be an on-site a digitized database, but we'll, we'll figure it out eventually. There are many more resources that I won't even be able to talk about today that you can access if you're here in person. And we even have a rare books department. Here is our oldest genealogy book that we have on, on site, that we have, period. Um, and it's kept in rare books, which, and by the way, rare books is a department um, on the third floor in our building, it's gorgeous. It's absolutely gorgeous, but you have to make an appointment to go in. Um, and we let anybody in, you just have to reserve time to go in. And so um, if you ever, we <laughs> oddly, we have a really huge um, bullfighting collection. And I'm talking um, accoutrement that bullfighters use, like those little helmets with and or the little hats and capes and all kinds of stuff, and many books about the subject. Um, but if you found something in our catalog that says it lives in rare books, you can make an appointment and uh, go up it, go up there in their reading room and take a look at it. But this is our oldest genealogy book. Um, it's a heraldry book on notable people in Augsburg, Germany, published in 1550. And I like to think of this specific page as depicting the world's first selfie. Uh, now, if you've, if you've heard me do, do this in a presentation before, I apologize. I use that joke every single time, but I think it's funny because it really does look like he's doing that. So I'll probably continue, just bear with me. Um, to, to round things out here, I just thought I'd show you a sampling of some of the neat items that I've found going through the folders in our pamphlet and manuscript collection. We have, uh, this, one, this one is a masonry certificate, which I think is interesting to show you as an example because these are probably only available to view in archives, I imagine, or maybe some Masonic libraries. Uh, but this was right there in the uh, folder for Thomas Orsborn. Here's a photograph. I'll run into photographs often in these uh, folders. And basically, I just have to kind of guess. This, this one happily has the names 
of the three men written on the photograph, but there wasn't a date, so I'm not sure when it was taken. But someone who's of that family, the Dicey family, will maybe recognize some of these people. This is a really lovely, huge, huge fan chart, uh, hand handmade. It folds a couple times, but I just thought it was so precise and meticulous, the penmanship. Um, so I thought I'd show it to you as an example. I love fan charts anyway. I'm not sure if I really know how to read them effectively as much as I do a regular tree chart, but they're just gorgeous. Here's a more modern entry. This is a whole binder that was given to me um, covering a 1967 family reunion in my hometown, actually, of uh, Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And um, I don't know these people, but, uh, but I thought it was just so cool and they just look so happy. And look on the right, they all have t-shirts with their names on them. Anyway, I just think that's dynamite. Here is a, an original marriage certificate between Joseph Bruner and Vesta Phillips of Minnesota. And we've got a handwritten pedigree chart for the Boynton family with Joseph Boynton as the number one spot on this uh, page. This was a really interesting thing I ran into. Um, a woman who was visiting her mother on her 94th birthday, who was confined to a hospital, um, she suggested, hey, why don't you tell me about your life and I'll, I'll type it up. And uh, that's what we have in our collection right now, an account of her life. This is a, an original uh, Bible record gorgeous handwriting and really unique. Of course, it's one of a kind, beautiful. Now, if any of you can tell me how to decipher this relationship map, <laughs> that's, that's the only thing I can think of to call it. Um, it's either genius or crazy, I can't tell, uh, but I love it, it's so, it's so beyond my brain. Um, but anyway, this fellow has a, a method to the madness. And then here is a hand-drawn and colored dedication to early California families. And this, this is really cool. It's kind of, it feels like kind of like crayon. It's a wax, waxy feeling a piece of paper. And those are just some of the many unusual things you could expect to find in our special collection. And I'm sure libraries across the nation have something similar. And one day, maybe we'll have like a consortium of a digitized set. It's just wonderful. <laughs>